Diolchan Gawr am fod, thank you very much for coming and, and showing an interest in this project, which is called Pererin Oiv is Olithriach May, I am a pilgrim. We're going to um, give you a bit of background about this project. Um, we're going to introduce you to the people who are part of the project and um, who, who we're working with. Um, I'm also going to uh, talk about what the main activities of the project are and how you can get involved. And then we also have our guest speaker tonight, Professor Wynne James of Cardiff University, who's going to talk a bit more about the song that has been the inspiration for this project. So this project is, um, is responding to a brief that was uh, put out by the Ancient Connections Project, which is a, a, a an EDRF, European Development um, Fund project, uh, between Pembrokeshire County Council and Wexford County Council. And the brief was looking uh, for a project um, that will seek to connect with the Welsh and Irish diaspora of North Pembrokeshire and Wexford. And the project is also responding, uh, the Ancient Connections Project, is creating a new pilgrimage route uh, between St. David's and Ferns in Wexford, uh, what they're calling a cross-border pilgrimage. And um, yes, the idea behind the project is that um, we are discovering ancient connections between these places and the wider world and also new connections um, between uh, these places and the wider world. Um, so. As part of that brief, um, there were three questions, which were, what is a pilgrimage? Who is a pilgrim? Are you a pilgrim? And there was this idea that this project could try and answer those questions. So to that question, are you a pilgrim? I ask, am I a pilgrim? And the answer that I give is Pererin Oiv. Um, and Pererin Oiv is a Welsh hymn. Uh, that literally means I am a pilgrim. So it's a, an, an affirmative statement. So when thinking about responding to this brief, that song came immediately to mind. And um, it's a, a Welsh hymn with Welsh lyrics. Um, there's a, a, a translation here on the screen um, that talks about um, being a pilgrim in a desert land uh, and, and longing uh, for, for another country, perhaps. Um, and as you see, this uh, sheet music is taken from the book Caneon Fees, which is a, a, a Welsh hymnal um, that has many hymns and many hymn tunes. And hymns are often, can be sung to many tunes. It so happens that this hymn is often sung to the tune of Amazing Grace. So um, it can uh, it, it, it perhaps has a, a wider resonance um, than uh, than Wales as well um, in that amazing the tune for Amazing Grace is a very very well known tune. So that was the sort of original inspiration for this project, um, and so the idea developed about asking people to sing this song uh, wherever they are in the world and record themselves singing it and to, to pin it to our online map. So um, with this idea, I uh, came um, to uh, present this idea to, to Span, who um, have uh, happily uh, come on board and uh, we're now working together on this project. Um, and I'm trying to move, yeah, here we are. So, um, I'm working with, uh, my name's Rowan O'Neill. I haven't said that. <laughs> so anyway, to Rowan. It's Michelle Rowan O'Neill. Um, and uh, as you can see, the Ancient Connections Project, um, one of their aims is to motivate both communities to rediscover their shared heritage, to be mentors for one another, sharing knowledge, experience and skills, and building new friendships to create a stronger sense of identity and place that will continue to flourish in years to come. So that's obviously a big um, part of this project. And at, at this point, so working with Span, it's Span Arts in Pembrokeshire, 
um, and also working with Wexford artists Rachel Fweilein uh, of Kale McCree and John O'Fweilein from the Traditional Archive channel. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm just going to say um, that in the room tonight, in the Zoom room, we also have Jacob, uh, who is controlling the Zoom, Jacob Whitaker, who works with SPAN. Um, we also have Alan Wills, uh, who's going to wave, hopefully. Yeah, and uh, he is responsible for our online map. And there's also Beth, the director of SPAN, and Donna, uh, who is a community producer with SPAN. Um, and then I'm now going to ask Rachel and John to introduce themselves to us as well. Um, okay. Thanks, Rowan. Um, delighted to see everybody here this evening. <clears throat> some of you I know um, and some of you I am just meeting tonight. Um, my name is Rachel, Rachel Yalon, and this is my husband, John. Hello. Um, we're delighted when um, Rowan came to us about the project. I suppose a little bit of background about us. We work mainly in traditional song, um, folklore, customs and traditions, and that kind of shared heritage between um, Wales and Wexford was of huge interest. I suppose the project uh, spans, that Rowan came to us with, spans a lot of our work in terms of the identity, traditional song, connecting it to place, language, all those sorts of things. Um, so we're really excited um, about how the project is going to develop and um, that kind of exploration of the deep connection between Wexford and Wales will be will be really important and I suppose everybody's input into that. Um, our, a lot of my work would be centred around um, creating songs in the traditional style. So say for instance you heard the Amazing Grace tune um, if, when, when we are, or any of the singers that are in the room, the traditional singers here in the room with us um, are creating songs in the traditional style, we'd often borrow an air from um, the tradition, an existing air from the tradition. You can also create an air, obviously, but if you borrow an air from the existing tradition. So it's un not unlike the whole idea of Amazing Grace being used with the, the Welsh hymn, how they actually became married together to, to become what you know we hear now. So um, that kind of idea um, is, is, is kind of what we're, we're looking at in terms of how that, you know, we can bring that sort of um, slant into the to the, the process um, with everybody else's input. So I am really looking forward to what John is too. Looking forward to the to the next few months. Um, learning from the key speakers that are going to be um, involved, and also hearing from the the wider community that's that's getting involved in the project. Um, I won't talk any more. I am John, and I will be presenting yeah. um, our own um, workshop in the early twelfth of January. So, uh, but in the meantime, we have a series of other speakers that we're all looking to um, learn and, and engage with. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Professor um, Wynne James later um, about the hymn. So uh, yeah, that's it. Great to be here. Delighted, excited and um, can't wait to see how this all develops. And uh, we're all going to learn from each other, I suppose, and uh, everyone's input will be will be crucial. Um, so yeah, thanks, Ron. That's that's me and John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, good. Right, so I'm going to, um, yes, yeah, so, so I should say thank you very much. I'm very excited to be working with you as well. Um, and uh, yeah, really um, pleased that you're that you're going to be with us. And thank you for, for bringing um, uh, your people here tonight as well. I know that some people have come, come through you. Um, so I'm now going to return to my PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how you can get involved in the project. Um, what I should say, um, actually, so since um, meeting with Rachel and John and starting to talk more about the project, um, this idea of, of um, how people might interact with this song has, has developed slightly. And so that, that idea about what is the song that calls you back home, um, we've kind of wide, widened out um, how people might want to contribute, but also this idea that we might be working towards creating a new song, um, that uh, a new version of Perer in Oiv for, for our times. Um, and so that will be part of the, the project's work as well. So um, there, uh, uh, a kind of um, 
a number of activities. Uh, so the first basic activity is that you can pin your song to our online map, but there is also uh, our series of interactive seminars, of which this is the first one, but these will be happening um, fortnightly uh, from every Thursday now, every fortnight. Um, and these are uh, feature speakers who have a particular um, knowledge or experience of um, ideas around diaspora and pilgrimage uh, from Irish and Welsh perspectives. Um, and then you can also get involved by making connections with other people. Um, we we love to hear from people who perhaps uh, live uh, connected to these places but live away now. Um, and we'd love to hear their story um, and uh, and also for them to share their story of connectedness to this place. And I know there are there are people here tonight who are in other countries apart from Wales and Ireland. So welcome and thank you for coming. Um, and then later on in the project, um, in the spring of 2023, 2023, there will we will be running a kind of songwriting and story sharing workshops and um, there'll be more information uh, to come about that. Um, we are also holding this sort of series, online series of seminars, of which tonight is one, um, that will continue. Uh, the next seminar will be on the 13th of October um, with David Greenslade. Then we have Gareth Bonello on the 27th of October. David is talking about his experience um, in America, including setting up an American uh, Welsh society in Georgia. Um, Gareth Bonello is talking about um, uh, Welsh Methodist activity in Kazi and his own experience of being in, in Kazi and, uh, and working with musicians there. Um, Pamela Petro, who's also here tonight, is, is talking about the concept of Hiraith and uh, what it means to be connected to a country that you might not um, not actually come from. Um, and uh, then we have Catherine Dunn, who's talking about uh, the Irish in London um, and uh, a particular generation who emigrated um, sort of in the late late 50s, early 60s. Um, and Helen Phelan, who's talking, um, she's, uh, she's of Irish heritage, born in New York, but has now moved back to Ireland and is working a lot um, with uh, m migrant communities and, and around the idea of, of, of singing as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of belonging. Um, so, and then finally, on the 12th of January next year, we'll have John and Rachel, um, who will be talking about their work in Wexford, and that will sort of move us into our uh, more creative phase of the project in terms of um, working on our our new song. So um, that's uh, that is the the uh, the kind of activity of the project, um, and uh, yeah, and I guess what I wanted to say was. In a way, I sort of think about the the project itself as a kind of a pilgrimage. Um, in that, yes, there is this basic act of perhaps singing a song and pinning it to this map, but there's also this exchange through this rich um, sharing of experiences through these seminars um, that um, I hope will enrich our experience and way of thinking in terms of of what we what we then make and what we then put in this uh, in in the song that we work on in the new year. Um, so I am going to, I sort of feel like I'm, I've spoken a long time now and I'm, I'm, um, we, we, we start um, tonight uh, with a seminar really in that I've invited Professor uh, Wynne James here to, to speak. Um, but I wanted to introduce him with this quote from, from John F. Kennedy, who is a, a kind of famous son of, of Wexford, um, just in this idea that um, uh, Pererin Oiv has become uh, the kind of inspiration for this project, but I thought, uh, but the project may end up encompassing other songs as well. Um, and I, I wanted us to think about um, 
uh, yeah, the, the myths that can surround things that 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 come down through time, um, and so that's uh, I, I happened to bump into. Well, I went to a talk by Professor James um, at the East Stedford this year, and he was talking about William Williams. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to start our sessions with actually hearing more about the person who wrote Pered in Oiv and uh, his context, and also connection to Pembrokeshire. Betty, at this point, I am going to to hand over to um, Rathlo uh, Win James or Cardiff Prithaskol Cardiff, um, and uh, he's going to talk about Pantakelin's pilgrimage. I'll just give you a bit more introduction. I will stop sharing my screen and allow um, Win to uh, be spotlighted and also to share his. Um, I just want to say, yes, yeah, so Wynne is um, he's a lecturer in modern Welsh literature since 1994 at Cardiff University with special interest in religion, identity and folk culture. Uh, and also a special interest in, in song, in the hymn and the ballad. Uh, and he's also worked as a co-director of the Cardiff Centre for Welsh American Studies. Um, and with and also has um, worked with the oh, special interest in the anti-slavery movement and the Welsh diaspora of Patagonia. So um, all very relevant interests to the to the um, to the themes of this project. And I'm I'm really um, pleased and grateful that Wynne is here tonight to speak to us. Firstly, to introduce on our Iwin Dioch. I am very happy to be able to share the screen. I am very happy to be able to share the screen. I am very happy to be able to share the screen in a moment, but uh, just uh, initially to, to thank Rowan very much for um, the invitation to come this evening and to, to talk about. Uh, William Williams of Hunter Kelly, and I'm, I'm very much aware that um, I, I, I know some people, like, you know, uh, on screen, and uh, I'm very much aware that some of them will know a lot about William Williams, uh, and will be able to access the the, the Welsh hymns I, I have on on the on some of the screens for you, whereas other people will probably know very little about him. So. Um, I'm there the other day, I said I'd become right with I and Tabli Meon Rai, Brodega, come right with him and Rao, and Oran Amsera, Oran Elven, a Kavuino, and Sisneg with a Buya. Let's see if the. This is always the dangerous point, isn't it? When does your. Um, As the ah right, that's I think is. Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's good. Good, and then just hope that it'll all move on correctly. <laughs> um, well, as as I was uh, saying, this is a, a very general uh, introduction to William Williams of uh, and very elementary to some people, uh, but not so for other, as others, I'm sure, and. Um, I want to start just making the point that Wales, of course, in, in our day is, is often being labelled label the land of song. And to a great degree, that is because of the, um, the hymn singing that has characterised Wales uh, for the past, um, well, two or three centuries. But I think it, it is a mistake. I was in a, a, a meeting not long ago in, in, in America, as it happens, and uh, someone was talking about Welsh hymn singing as if it had always been uh, a phenomenon of, of Welsh life and culture. But that's just not true. Um, it really begins in the 18th century with the, with the Methodist revival and really starts in earnest uh, um, when we have what, what is called in Wales the, the Gaman Vagani movement, the, the Welsh hymn singing festival movement, which really starts round about the 1860s. And it's from then on really that you get this, um, th this disciplined Welsh singing, uh, four-part harmony, um, 
and uh, Welsh people, uh, you know, going going um, to to compose hymn tunes that become very famous uh, around the world, really. Um, uh, Ronda, uh, you, I'll, I'll refer later on, all being well to the very well known hymn, the, the, his best known hymn, really, in, in certainly in English, uh, Guide Me Over Great Jehovah. Uh, Pante Kellyn wrote the words for that, as we'll see. But the music actually isn't composed until um, uh, the, well, around about the time of the, the uh, Welsh Revival of 1904, 1905. Um, but of course, uh, Guide Me Over Great Jehovah to the tune of Kumronda is actually one of the most famous of all and well known of all um, Welsh hymns and hymn tunes. Um, it's it's one of the, they, they try to dry, make league tables of, of popular hymns. And uh, Guide Me Over Great Jehovah comes regularly within the top 10 um, hymns. Um, um, worldwide, uh, both in, in, in English and in translation into other languages and to the, uh, usually to, to come around there. So in that sense, William Williams Pantacallion is a very international figure. When you think that um, a quarter of the world's population uh, adhere to some form of Christianity, uh, you can see how many people worldwide uh, are singing his hymns every week, uh, or singing that hymn in particular, Guide Me Over Great. Uh, Jehovah or Guide Me Over Great Redeemer, um, and not just on uh, rugby fields, as we as we are well you were aware, of course, in Wales, you know, um, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore, and etc. Um, but as I say, up until the um, the emergence really of William Spanter Kelly, who we can consider as the the father of the Welsh um, evangelical congregational hymn. What we have in, in Welsh singing from the time of the Protestant Reformation onwards, there is congregational singing, but it's uh, psalm singing. Um, the, the, the Welsh, as the, the Scottish and uh, the English after the Protestant Reformation, they followed Calvin, who said that God was so majestic that the only, um, the only words that were suitable to address him in public worship were the words of the Bible themselves, uh, the Bible itself. And therefore, um, the metrical psalms um, were um, king, if you like, in terms of any congregational singing that was happening in, in churches. But then in the, um, well, from the 1730s on, really, there's a, a profound religious awakening that begins in that period, and Williams Pantacallion becomes one of the early leaders of that movement, um, and that that spreads throughout Wales. And it initially starts in in parts of, of South Wales, but it spreads uh, throughout the country um, by the end of the the century. And as as uh, you see from what they said on the on the screen, it's usually referred to as the Methodist revival. Um, sometimes called evangelical revival, and it's part of an international movement. Again, there's a, there's a Welsh uh, revival, but there are also uh, revival movements linked to the Wesleys and, and Whitfield in England and uh, similar movements in Scotland. And in America, you also get what's called the, the Great Awakening in the same period, this, this revival of religious uh, fervor really, and commitment. And um, in, in, in theological terms, it was very much uh, an orthodox movement. Where it differed, if you like, from the, uh, because most people in Wales at the time were members of the, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, which was the established church, the, the state church. Um, where the, and, and, and the Methodists, a lot, well, most of them in, initially were, were members of that. Uh, established church, but where they differed uh, from the other members of the church, the nominal members of the church, if I can put it that way, is their emphasis on personal experience. That is, it wasn't enough for you to believe um, these um, Christian beliefs in, in, your, in your head, you know, the, the Trinity, for example, or, or the person and work of, 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 of Jesus Christ, uh, but that you had to experience this personally. And this happened to Williams Pantacallion himself as a, as a student, um, a 20-year-old student in, a, in an academy in, um, 
in in uh, Breckenshire. Uh, he he heard um, uh, one of the early leaders of the Methodist movement preaching, a man called Howell Harris, and he says that he was caught uh, by a summons from heaven. He said, but in, when, while listening to this um, this uh, sermon, Dalwood the uh, we saw the God Gani Soon the Khan the Um and he comes to this sort of deep personal experience now of a relationship with uh, with uh, God in Christ, which the, the Methodists and, and other evangelicals in in Britain in that period would, would describe as um as regeneration, a new birth. Um I think of uh, of uh, Charles Wesley's famous um, uh, carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, you know, born, uh, that Christ was born to give them second birth. That is, you become a new person, if you like, through these religious experiences. And what happens then is that these people now want to express their, um, their experiences um, in song. And... Um, in other words, they, 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 they don't feel that these, the Psalms, however important the Psalms were, were expressing their own personal experiences in, in, that, um, in that dramatic, very personal way. And um, the, the, the adherence now to the Methodist movement, and that Methodist movement does spread then over into the, uh, what, what, we, what we would call the, the old and unconformist movements, the, the, the uh, denominations and the Baptists and the, the Congregationalists. Uh, so it does become a, a, a Wales Wide movement and, and, and a cross denominational movement. Um, what happens is that people come together now in what are called Sayande Proviad in Welsh. Um, so, uh, the word Sayat actually comes from the English word society, but they come in together in, in these societies um, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, often ex um, discussing their spiritual experiences together and worshipping together in, in a more informal setting than the, the formal um, Anglican church uh, services. And these meetings have, have been described as experience meetings. And what happens in these experience meetings is that um, uh, they, they start by singing a hymn, and then they they, they discuss their their uh, their uh, experiences and, and share their experiences. They they, um, they they read from the Bible. They they, they pray, etc. And then, quite often at the end, they would they would finish as well after the formal sayat had finished. They would they would be singing these hymns. Uh, then um, sometimes um, for hours upon hours after the the formal uh, sayat had, uh, had had finished, them. so hymns now become a central core part of um, the the Methodist or evangelical uh, movement's expression of their their faith and experiences, and the person that really comes to the fore. Uh, as the the father, as I say, the hymn uh, of, 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 of these type of hymns is William Williams of Pantakelion. Now um, we're talking about the um, uh, the the north uh, part of of, of Cardiganshire. There's a map on the screen there, and uh, it, it, the, the the name is in Welsh, but Tanem Davri there uh, would perhaps be better known to some of you as Tan Davri which uh, in the 18th century was a very important um, uh, drover town. People would come bring their cattle and, and uh, other animals for, for miles around to Llandavri, and then the drovers would take them over to, um, well, to the south of England and, and mainly. And William Williams of Pantakelin, as we call him, he spent, he was, he lived, he was born in that area uh, and, uh, oops, um, if you, See my uh, the cursor. They're going to a place called Pantakelion. There, that was a farm where he spent most of his adult life. He was actually born a little to the north of that in a place called Kelmcoid. Um And what happens then? Uh, Williams uh, becomes one of the main leaders of the Methodist uh, um, movement in the eighteen in the seventeen forties, and um, he then um, hold on. Uh, what, what you see is a, a group now of, um, of, of hymn writers growing up in his shadow, if you like, other Methodist uh, or Methodist um, style hymn writers um, belonging to other denominations. 
some of you are familiar with the name of Morgan Rees, for example, um, or, or David Jones or Gay, or you, you see a, a flowering now of uh, Welsh hymn writing of in this Methodist experiential style uh, in, in, in that area. Now, William Smantichelli in himself, he was born, uh, he was, he's a farmer's uh, son and, and was fairly comfortably off um, during his um, during his life, uh, you know, uh, when, when of the um, the farming community then of the the Llandovery area in terms of his background and his daily involvement, he and his his wife ran the farm at at Pantacellian. Um We don't know exactly what he looked like. Uh, it's not, oh dear me, not um, aggressive now as it should. Hold on, and, and. Click in the middle of the thing and then press onwards. In the middle, yeah. Ah, right, right, thanks. Um, we don't know exactly what he looked like. Um, the, the famous portrait of him, which you'll see on the place, is the one on the right there on the screen, which was actually published in, for the first time in 1867, based on a sketch, which I have put on the left-hand side of the screen there. It was made um, from the memory of, of someone who'd listened to Pantakelly and preach, uh, you know, a good number of times, but it was actually made from memory after his death. So we don't actually know exactly what he looked like. He wasn't an, an important enough person in his day to have a, a portrait painted of him, uh, important in the, in the social hierarchy then. Um, but I, I put the, on the next screen there, uh, you'll see an artist called Wynne Melville Jones there presenting. He'd, he'd made a, a picture of the Pantakelly farmhouse um, in 2017, in the 300th anniversary of the birth of William Smantichelli, and as you seen in that in that picture, they're presenting uh, the um, a copy of, the, of that picture, a framed copy, then to um, Mr. Cecil Williams there and his wife Cynthia, who, who farm at Pantichelli. Some of you will, I'm, I'm sure, uh, have met them. Um, the family are very welcoming at, at the farm there and had not always always very grand here and, and good word on your own. And uh, Mr. Cecil Williams is a direct descendant of William Spantakelly and uh, his his face is probably the nearest we'll get to, to knowing what Spantakelly looked like. Um, but uh, as I as I say, he, he starts in earnest writing hymns in 1744. There's the first little collection of hymns that appear, just nine hymns, but but from then on, right until the the seventeen eighties, Pantakelyan lives for um, well, through he spans most of the the eighteenth um, century, born in seventeen seventeen, and he dies in seventeen ninety one, and for most of that period, from the mid seventeen forties onward, he is writing hymns, mainly in Welsh. Um, he wrote over eight hundred and fifty hymns in Welsh altogether. Uh, and about 120 English hymns as well. Um, well, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure the Welsh speakers listening will, will will agree. I think if you compare his Welsh and English hymns, not that he wasn't fluent in English and 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 had lot a lot of his education in English, uh, but there's there's a power and a fluency and a, a lyrical beauty in his Welsh hymns at their best, which do uh, put his English hymns in into the shade. But he comes to the fore now as the main hymn writer of the Methodist revival uh, of uh, 19th century, 18th century Wales, and, and indeed his, his work remains popular today. The the interdenominational inter hymnal Canaion uh, Fiedd of uh, 2001 contain 80 of his hymns out of uh, um, about eight, 800 hymns in all, so 10%, if you like. Of the, uh, uh, of the of the current uh, hymn hymn book in in Welsh is um, is, is the work of of Williams Pantakelly. Now, what I've got on the screen here uh, is the um, one of his hymns in Welsh, Midavla um, Maith the Advangwar, which is. Sir John Morris Jones, who's professor of Welsh in uh, in Bangor at the beginning of the 20th century, describes this this hymn as one of the 
most beautiful of Welsh lyrics. And he, he wasn't just referring to hymns, he was just referring to Welsh lyrics as a, a, a on block, secular and, uh, and holy, if you like. And uh, the, the reason I put that on the screen, as you see it, it's, it's in Welsh with a, with a, a, a mythical translation by Edmund. Um, uh, and uh, the, the reason for putting that on the screen and the, the, the picture there uh, of him is by uh, an artist called Ryan Davis from Carmarthen. Uh, a selection of his work was published by the, the fine uh, printers, uh, uh, the Grigor Nog Press. And uh, she did some illustrations for that, uh, for that uh, edition of of uh, or selection of Lance Pantikelin's work. Now, the reason I, I I I put that this one on the screen to start with as an example of his his work is because it it does encapsulate the main theme of his work, if you like, and the main theme of his work is Jesus Christ and his death on the cross as the means of um, well, this experience, if you like, of this this rebirth comes to to Williams through the, this um, this experience of of salvation, of of, of um, forgiveness of sin, uh, and a new relationship now with God come to him through belief in Christ's death on the cross. And you see, in in this hymn, he starts by feeling his um, his uh, the enormous sort of guilt. But that guilt turns to song at the cross of Calvary, and then the, he he develops this by saying, "There's no one like Christ." Uh, Christ. So he doesn't actually mention Christ by name uh, throughout the the, the hymn, um, but you know who he is. There's Tebigido Vie, and that that Vie there, that hymn there is Christ, of course. And then the, the third verse, the very central verse of the hymn, describes the the cross. And Christ dying on the cross, so that the the vile they become clean. And then the the end of the hymn then is this expression of desire now to be with Christ uh, at, at 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 the end of time. And and this is really the the vision, if you like, that's driving Williams uh, along and is is key to his pilgrimage. It's it's the start of his pilgrimage, if you like. You know this faith in Christ. Uh, and the end of his pilgrimage is actually, as we'll see in the last verse there, uh, when he'll be gazing at the wondrous face of Christ, which is, he, he, it was beautiful in this world, gazing on him through faith, but in, in heaven, face to face, if you like, uh, it'll be much more fair again. So this central uh, theme of the cross runs through his whole work and the relationship with 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 uh, Christ uh, that that comes from that um, that stems from that and the the other main theme you get running through his his, his work is again touched upon in this first um, in this first uh, hymn I put on the screen for you uh, is is another uh, hymn uh, the next hymn I put on the screen for you here uh, it is describing his um, his great love of God in Christ, his beloved. Um, in, in this particular case, we have not um, not, not the uh, a metrical translation, but a, a literal translation by H. A. Hodges, and uh, you can find that in in a volume called uh, "Flame in the Mountains," as you you'll see there, which I I would recommend to you, and as as I probably would, be since I edited the volume. But um, uh, here you see, and, and this, if, again, if you didn't know this was about Christ, it could almost be a, a, a secular love song, couldn't it? You know, that he's looking, again, this, this, this long-term view, looking over uh, on his pilgrimage, over the mountains of Wales, and the, you know, the, the landscape of Wales is very much part of, of this, um, uh, of his expression. Um, he spent the 40 year or more years from, 18 uh, from 17 mid 1740s to the to the 1780s traveling throughout Wales um, ministering to the uh, Methodist Sayat, you know the the Methodist experience meetings and um, uh, he's he probably traveled around about 2500 miles every year on horseback from from Pantacellin 
and going over the, the mountains of Wales and going through the streams and rivers of Wales uh, on horseback. And you can see that reflected in his uh, in his hymns. And you've got that here, Rhyn Edrych Roth y Brynia Pell, Llam Danat Bob yr Awr, Tyrdd Fan Ulyd, Mae'n Hwyr Hai, Am Hai, El Bron Mynd i Lawr. There's a here, there's a longing here for the beloved. And as I say, if you didn't have the, the, um, the capital a in an in a new leader, capital B in Beloved, you could be actually um uh, it could be a love song to um to uh, um you know a secular level if you like. Um and then the the third main theme you have in his work, I say the the cross of Christ, the um the beauty of Christ as 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 a lover. Uh, but then the third um, main theme that runs through it, or the main uh, image that runs through his work, is um, what we've already heard about. Um, the, you know, Pereira uh, this, this, this uh, again, uh, um, this, this is a translation, uh, a, a metrical translation of the hymn here by, by uh, Bobby Jones, who was professor of. Of, of Welsh in, in Aberystwyth. Uh, I know he lectured to, well, he lectured to me and to at least one other person in the, uh, in the, in the meeting this evening. Um, and uh, again, another of Rian Davis's uh, illustrations here where you can see particularly on horseback, they're looking over the mountains. And um, what you see here in, in this hymn in particular, but also through his whole work is he's drawing on Biblical imagery, you you do have imagery of Wales and and Welsh you know mountains in in his hymns, um, but here what what is even more central is biblical imagery and especially the imagery from the book of Exodus, uh, which um, where where the Israelites, if you remember, the Israelites at the, uh, are in captivity in Egypt, and then they they um, are well, they escape basically, but they, they 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 come out of bondage in 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 Egypt, go through the Red Sea, and then uh, wander through the desert, and for um, uh, about forty years before they um, they go through uh, Jordan River into the Promised Land, uh, and that is seen by William Spanterkellin and countless other hymn writers and and and, and Christian writers as uh, an allegory, if you like, of the Christian life. That is, they were, they, they, you've been released from bondage of, of sin. You've come to this new relationship with God. Um, but then you're, you're on a pilgrimage then through a desert land. And you can see in, 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 the, um, in, uh, in, in the third verse here, uh, there's a prayer in that third verse for the Holy Spirit to come to lead him. Uh, lead him by a fire uh, at, at night and a pillar of cloud by day, and that is what happened in the Exodus story. That is, the the Israelites were being led through the desert with this uh, pillar uh, of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And then, as you see in 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 this hymn, um, as in so much of, of William's work, of course, there's this longing, this yearning for uh, for the land and where people are now singing and extolling, can you understand the voice and for eternity and, uh, about uh, the death of, of Calvary in, in heaven? That's where he's aiming for. And the second verse, doesn't it, talks about the way he's, he, he, he thinks on his earthly journeys, he can, he can hear the sound of the heavenly choir um, who'd actually succeeded in um, reaching the promised land that is in reaching heaven and that encourages him on his journey and uh, again uh, the fourth verse there which talks about him um, prone to wander again is something that you, you, you see throughout his hymns and, and in Methodist evangelical hymns generally this, this, um, this awareness that temptations of this world um, are, are, um, are surrounding you and that you're, you're in danger of straying from the, 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 the pilgrim's path. And of course, 
Um, William, I'm sure as well, is, is very much aware of um, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan and was very familiar with that, with that work. So I, I'm, I'm aware that time is going on. Um, I, I don't know if you want to, to, to stop there or I, I do have a, a second section. Um, I'm, I'm looking for uh, advice here, really. Do you, do you want to say a bit about um, the uh, connection with Pembrokeshire? Is that <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair enough. Yes. I mean, they, they, just as a, as a general comment about um, Methodism, as I say, the Welsh Methodism starts in Pembrokeshire. Um, uh, uh, as, well, no, it starts in South Wales, I should say. But Pem Pem Pembrokeshire is very much part of that early Methodist uh, develop developments there. And, and there are strong Methodist connections with Pembrokeshire. Um, throughout the the 18 well from the you know the fairly early beginnings of the of the Methodist revival right through into the 19th century of course and uh, there are some uh, very well-known names um linked to Methodism in um in in Pembrokeshire the one of the main leaders of the Methodist movement in the uh, in the 18th century uh, was a man called Howell Davis who was is is sort of nicknamed the Apostle of Pembrokeshire. Um, David Jones, who was known mainly as David Jones of Trangan in the Vale of Glamorgan, uh, was a very, very powerful Methodist preacher. People would flock there to hear him preach um, in their thousands. But he spends a lot of his time in Pembrokeshire as well. And then into the early uh, 19th century, again, you and you, you get um, Thomas Richards, um, the some of you will, not, will be very aware of, of um, Henry Richard, the the uh, apostle of peace in the in the nineteenth century. His his uncle was a, was a very well known um, Methodist minister there in the in the late eighteenth into the nineteenth century. So there are strong connections with um, with Pembroke by the Methodists, the the Calvinistic Methodists of Wales, but also of course um, uh, John Wesley would be going through South Wales on his way to Ireland on a quite a regular basis and would, would spend time in, in Pembrokeshire. Um, the the um, connection, the, 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 perhaps the, the most interesting connection right. between uh, William Smatakelly and, and Pembrokeshire is, um, is a hymn he wrote um, about, um, about, about the hope uh, that, um, it, it, it again refers to uh, to to um, it, it's an English hymn initially, or translated by his uh, his son into Welsh as Drosabrnir Tawich Niurog. Um, all those gloomy hills of darkness. Again, this this idea of of, of you know going through a, a difficult terrain, etc. Uh, but it's 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 driven forward by a a, a desire, uh, when more than desire, a longing. Um, and a, a strong belief that um, there were better times to come. There was a, a millennial period that William Swartikian believed was on the on the horizon, if you like. Uh, that uh, there were promises in the Bible that there would be a period. If I if I if I go on uh, quickly through some of these slides. Uh, um, yeah, uh, th this is the Welsh version of, of the Guide Me Hold Great Great uh, uh, Jehovah, which Williams published in 1762, Arglwydd Arwain Troi Ran A friend of his, another of the Methodist leaders, uh, actually translates that initially into, um, into uh, English. Uh, Peter Williams, the Bible um, commentator, does that in three verses. Well, the first verse, of course, is... Uh, is Peter Williams that is most well known? Well, is the well known version Guide Me, O Lord, Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through the Sparren Land. Uh, but then, what Williams does is he takes that verse, but then um, reworks um, part of Peter Williams's translation and does some of his own translating into English. And it's produced initially as a leaflet. Um, 
the use, uh, well, uh, as it says on the screen there, uh, it was uh, printed by the desire of uh, many Christian friends uh, as a favorite hymn sung by Lady Huntingdon's collegians. Now, Lady Huntingdon, um, a major leader in the um, in, in the Methodist and Evangelical Revival of the 18th century, uh, an, an English woman but with strong Welsh connections, opened a college at Howell, near Howell Harris's home in um, at Trebek. And you can see here, the, the uh, just to, to emphasize the same sort of um, imagery that we've had in um, Pereri Noiv. Um, you know, the, the, he's a pilgrim for the barren land, He's, he's praying now for a fiery and cloud, cloudy pillar to, to lead him. Uh, and, and then he comes to the verge of Jordan, the river Jordan, and, and prays to be landed safe in, on Canaan's side, uh, that is on the side of the promised land. And, and then his, his last verse there, which is, isn't uh, as well known, says, says, shows how he's musing on this heavenly home, this, this desire, this longing for his heavenly, heavenly home to be with Jesus. Um, but uh, Lady Huntingdon had inherited um, the responsibility for an orphanage in Georgia. Um, uh, George Whitfield, one of the main leaders of the, the English Methodists, had, had set up a, a, an orphanage in Georgia. And uh, when he died in 1770, she had responsibility for that. And uh, she asked William Spanticelli to, um, to write um, some hymns in English and uh, asked the Trebekah College there. Uh, but he, he actually writes this hymn, All Those Gloomy Hills of Darkness, to be included in, um, in this collection of hymns that he published in 1772, um, where... Uh, He's, he's expressing now this, uh, this desire now for the Christian gospel to, to, to go worldwide this bless, for this blessed jubilee, this, this um, jubilee there, I mean, it refers to, um, to salvation, uh, a freedom that comes to people through, through, through faith. But there's also, as, as, as you see in, in the fourth verse here, uh, may the glorious days spread thousand years soon appear, make no delay. Lord, I long to see that morning when I, the, the gospel will spread throughout the world and um, fly abor abroad, eternal gospel, win and conquer, never ceases. All this imagery of um, warfare and light and darkness and, and release and freedom running through this, uh, this, this hymn. That's the, the Welsh version there. And it's reflecting William Spontichelian's belief and many, many other evangelical Christians in his day that there was going to be a period of success, a worldwide success of the gospel. Um, that is, that there's going to be an extensive period, um, point five there on the screen, where um, the Christian gospel would hold sway throughout the world. And not just the Christian gospel spreading throughout the world, but in, 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 in well, as a result of that, really, uh, because the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our Lord, as you can see the the, um, the quotation there from Revelation. That is, the um, um, the Lord spreads, and it says, you know, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven." Where well, we just believe that it was going to be this extended period when that would happen, and it wasn't just a matter of the gospel spreading worldwide but also in, in, in tandem with that social justice, which would include um, uh, uh, abolition of slavery. And William Smartichelian is actually the first voice um, in print in Welsh uh, to be raised against, um, against the slave trade in 1762, around about the time he was writing these hymns that we, we've been discussing now. And, um, but the Pembroke connection is that um, an, one tradition says that uh, William Spantichelli, and there was uh, an important um, local squire, uh, Bowen of Swain Guire in, in, in North Pembrokeshire, who was very, very supportive of the Methodists. And William Spantichelli was staying there, uh, according to the, 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 the story, at, at, at uh, one um, 
uh, one occasion, and uh, George Bowen asked him to write uh, a hymn which would refer to the or, or write a poem about the the mountains of, of uh, the hills of Pembrokeshire, and uh, it said that Williams um, was inspired to do that by looking out of the the window of his uh, bedroom in uh, in Twinguire Manor House. Uh, where um, opposite uh, Twinguire Manor House, you can see Carningley, one of the the the, uh, the mountains of Pembroke, are rising, um, uh, you know, right right outside the well, not right outside, but you know, in close proximity to to Twinguire, and uh, you know, all the gloomy hills of darkness uh, is uh, said to have been written uh, according to one um, version of the story. Uh, when Williams was staying in Twinguire. And interestingly enough, um, he did go around about that period, around about 1771, when all those Blowing Hills of Darkness was being written. He was in Twinguire um, in the company of um, Daniel Rowland and uh, Lady Huntington. They were on a, 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 an evangelistic trip to Pembrokeshire in that time. So that there's, you can see, this worldwide um, vision of the spread of Christianity, then uh, coming together, then in this uh, this desire to have uh, a hymn book to be sung in in Georgia, and uh, as I say, generally this this, um, this this great desire for social justice and Christian gospel to to spread uh, through the land. So there there is a Pembrokeshire, certainly a, a very uh, interesting Pembrokeshire link there with with that hymn in particular. Well, I, I think I'd better uh, stop at that point. Uh, I think my time is more than enough. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. It was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. That was that was great. Brilliant. Um, and does anybody have? Um, are you all right to take questions? If anybody has. Yes, 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 yes. Um, would anybody like to to ask anything? Um, Yes, I was just looking. There are some comments. I think there in the. Yeah, I think. Can, I, oh, can I take this opportunity to? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. I know the voice well. <laughs> can I take this opportunity, therefore, to um, thank Wynne for his usual erudite um, comments, etc. He, as always, he speaks with bulky authority. And I say that not just because we were contemporaries at university in Aberystwyth. But yes, the connection with Pembrokeshire is very strong. And just another anecdote in addition, addendum to the Fuin Guire story. I mean, it is said, or that's what's been said down here anyway, that once the hymn had been written, he recited it the following morning to Tom the ostler. Tom had been looking after William Williams's horse overnight. Ah. And Tom was um, usually inebriated. He had a strong tendency for the drink. But once he heard this hymn being recited to him, he gave up the drink. Mm -hmm. and Williams Pentecellian gave him a groat. And apparently Tom kept that groat, he never spent it, just to remember the occasion when he saw the light, I suppose. Mm. So that shows the um, the way that um, Williams was able to change people's lives through his hymns and through his personality. Yeah, yes, that's... Uh... That, that's very true. I mean, that that last sentiment is is very true. When uh, the man H. A. Hodges, whose translation I I, uh, I um, included in at one on one of the slides, says in 1976 um, when he's writing about he he was um, a professor of philosophy in Reading University who'd, uh, from Yorkshire who had learned Welsh mainly to study the works of. Uh, of William Spontekellian and of Anne Griffiths, the other uh, great Welsh hymn writer. And um, he says there that uh, William Spontekellian cast his spell over Welsh-speaking Wales. 
um, you know, for almost two centuries. And, and, and that spell in 1976 was still there. And of course, we just got the the tail end of that, haven't we, with, with Bread of Heaven, Feed Me Thou and Evermore on the, on the rugby field. Um, but you, you're, you're quite right, you know, he had a, an extremely influential um, ministry, not just in, I mean, he was preaching, he was leading these Syed meetings, but he also produced, you know, all about 90 books, you know, not just his hymns, there are, there are, um, there, there are a prose works all geared to, um, um, if I had time, I would have mentioned it, the, the, the first condemnation of slave trade, uh, of the slave trade, as they say in Welsh, is by Williams in a book he, he started writing in 1762, which is called Pantheologia, or the history of all the um, the re religions of the world. And he goes through the whole of the world, describing all their religions, but not just describing their religions, but describing you know their customs, their their their, their food, their dress, etc. And uh, you know he's a, he was a volcanic figure in in many ways. Um, uh, but yes, the 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 story of co of course of Fringuire is uh, as as Heaven will know well is uh, was popularized by D J Williams, a very important Welsh uh, story um, called story writer, in uh, in a volume he produced in 1936, the year that he and Saunders Lewis and uh, Lewis Valentine burnt the um, bombing school in. Uh, in, in North Wales as a, as a protest there. But, uh, yes, he, he, he talks there about the tombs, uh, uh, grot, etc. Rosemary had a, a question, I think. Hi. Oh. Hi, thank you, Wynne. That was amazing. Really, really enjoyed it. It was great. Um, in you had, when you had the list up, six points, I didn't yes. know that um, Jews were... Um, being pushed towards or wanting to turn mm. to Christianity because yeah. it's usually the other way about. I've had a lot to do with Jews over the last few years, yeah. but and that was yeah. really surprising. Yeah, well, you see, they, they, this uh, this idea uh, which I described as the Puritan hope, it's something that that develops in, in, in quite strongly in the Puritan period, and then the Welsh Methodists and other evangelicals adopt that uh, that idea. There are, there are all sorts of theories going on about when. You know, there's talk in the Bible about a millennium period, and some be, be, argue that it's it's before Christ's return. Some argue it's after Christ's return, and others are arguing there is no millennium. We're actually living in the millennium now, this period yeah, where yeah, where Christ's yeah. kingdom comes to uh, to gradual fruition. You know, um, but not in in this long period of heaven on earth, if you like. But they were they were drawing there with with, with reference to the the Jews. Uh, they were drawing on uh, the writings of Paul, where where Paul is saying that um, in 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 the book of Romans especially he, he talks about well uh, has God forsaken his his chosen people? You know the, the he Paul is the the apostle to the Gentiles is saying, well, no, the Gentiles are now certainly becoming part of the church, but there'll be a day, uh, and if, if the sort of um, the turning against Christ by, by uh, well, not all the Jews, of course, but by the Jewish leadership, meant that the Gentiles were coming into the church, how much more would the Gentiles come into the church once the, the, the Jews are converted on block to Christianity? And so people like William Spantichelin believed that the Jews would be um, a foretest of this general, powerful uh, spread of the gospel throughout the whole world to all nations, but starting with the Jews. Ooh. And um, in, in, in 19th century Wales, for example, you, the, the, there's great support for a specific um, mission to the Jews. The, the, the Calvary Methodists in the 19th century set up a, a mission to the Jews in London and employ a, 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 a missioner who works specifically on, on that, a man called John Mills. So this is something that runs throughout the late 18th into the well, middle, late uh, 19th century, really, in, 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 uh, in what one would call evangelical um, Methodist circles in, in, in the Welsh context, certainly, and wider. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. The question from David. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. 
uh, thank you for the covering it. Yeah, I'm not Cat. This was somebody else's computer before me. I'm David. Yes, um, I did. I did know that, David. The Auckland, how did the world? Um, as Rowan pointed out, I had the pleasure and privilege to start the St. David's Welsh Society of Atlanta, Georgia, way back in 1984. And we did as much Welsh, Welsh research as we could in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I never heard of this orphanage project, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm still in touch with people there. I'm sure they'd love mm -hmm. to know um, more about it because of this link. And I wonder mm -hmm. if, uh, if we exchange emails. Yes, yes, by all means, yes. yes. It was It was rather, um, it's a difficult subject um, because although George Whitfield was very, um, very, well, keen to put it mildly on, um, on, on arguing that uh, black slaves should be treated humanly, if you like, um, and, and preach the gospel to them, etc., he did keep slaves in 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 the uh, the home in Georgia, yeah. and um, uh, Countess of Huntingdon, after she inherits this after uh, um, after uh, Whitfield's death, retains the slaves there. Okay. Um, she has an ambivalent relationship to slavery in the sense that she is she argues that it's better to keep slaves in, in a good condition, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, treated well and, um, and, and pre preaching the gospel to them rather than releasing them to a, a very difficult world, uh, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the surroundings. So there's, it, she, she's, as, as I say, this, this sort of very ambivalent um, um, situation with regard to slavery. And of course, because she's back in England, she can't keep her, uh, you know, all things are going on in Georgia, I'm afraid, that uh, she wouldn't have uh, supported. But um, it, it's very interesting. Um, in, in the next generation, a man called Morgan John Rees, who was a radical Baptist, evangelical uh, minister, he, he goes to the States in 1794. He's, he's one of the main people who, um, I'm, I'm afraid, I don't think he's got any Pembrokeshire connections. <laughs> he was from uh, the Caerphilly area of, uh, of South Wales. But uh, he um, really escapes. He's, he's under threat of, of, of being um, uh, imprisoned because of his radical views in 1794. And he, he goes over to the States and is one of the main leaders of the anti-slavery movement in Wales before he goes to the States. And in the States, he goes on this horseback uh, trip of, uh, well, I say trip, is a, a year-long journey. Uh, the Welsh obviously like their long um, journeys on a horseback, but he's looking for somewhere to set up a Welsh um, settlement. And he goes to Georgia mm. and he goes past the, um, the um, orphanage, which by then had been, um, it was in ruins. It had been um, the, uh, a, a storm had burnt it down. And he sees the remains of the orphans. He said, I'm, I'm not surprised it was burnt down like this. It's a sort of punishment by God mm. for, for keeping slaves there, you know. Um, so there's, they're quite interesting Welsh connections with... Um, Georgia. With Georgia and with slavery in particular, you know. Do you know where the, the location in Georgia? Oh. I, 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 can, I can let you know that, yes. Yeah, you it, and in, I can the, do that. In the Savannah area, I think. Yeah. All right, yeah, well, I've got relatives in Savannah. Oh, there we are. <laughs> it's a small and, world. Um, of course, the first, I think it's one of the lines of the um, verses in hymn 37 is, let the Indian, let the Negro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I lived uh, with the black community in Georgia. I have friends in the Cherokee community. So I really yeah. would, mm. I could pass it on to them over there. Yeah. But just to share to everyone, if they haven't been to John Wesley's house in London, it really is a fascinating, uh, the Wesley Chapel and Lysham Museum, it's called. Mm. It's at EC1Y, I, uh, 1AU, I think, the City Road, London. It's really well worth a visit. It's mm. notable, especially for its um, sanitation, for the toilets. I just want to <laughs> check that out there. It really is worth a visit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, John Wesley, of course, was vehemently anti-slavery, vehemently so, as compared to, to Whitfield, who was 
is not not quite in that in the same category. But it is interesting that you get this strong Welsh um, opposition to slavery. Yeah, really, that's a story, though. Really, Really growing up from William Swantekalian's time on, you know, he's, he's the first person to to translate a, sla a slave, one of the slave uh, uh, narratives, as they called, you know, talking about, you know, where, where it, you know, the, a biography of one of the early slaves who was who uh, converts to Christianity, and it, that's being used as uh, uh, or those slave narratives, which were being supported by Lady um, uh financially, were being used as sort of political tracts against slavery um, and of course that there is an interesting and unfortunate um, Pembrokeshire link there of course with what we're talking about now because there were a number of, of, of um, uh, owners you know the 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 landed gentry in in, in Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire who had um, plantations in, uh, in in places like Jamaica um, that's uh, that's the other side of the coin, isn't it? You know, so you you got these all those ruling hills of darkness, where this this desire to see um, again that that him has been criticised as if it's treating these people as barbarians, but it's not really. I mean, the word barbarian is being used. You know, let 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 the Negro and, and let the rude barbarian. But actually, what they're saying is these people have the potential to becoming uh, Christians. Exactly the same way as I've become a Christian, sure. and and to save them from their barbarism, if you like, you know, to become full. Because in in the 18th century, it's quite interesting. There's um, one of the big divides was not so much colour of skin, but but uh, were you 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 a matter of faith, you know, and and, and that's all coming into it. Uh, so, but it's a very interesting area generally, of course. Yeah. And a very controversial area as well. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I, I'm going to um, widen uh, questions out now. I think so. Diolch and Valdwin. I just, uh, I can, yeah, I, I thought it was important to give context about who William Williams was as the author of this hymn. And, and um, I was particularly drawn to what you said about. Um, him writing as a as as personal expression that we yeah. um I think not everybody today could perhaps relate the same to to the words yeah. but to understand yeah. that in the in the context of his day this this is a, a kind of expression and I I was interested in that uh, line in your talk tonight about guilt guilt turns to song yeah. I just that's an interesting um yeah. Interesting concept, and also that 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 hymn could also could be read as a, a secular love song if you yeah. if you didn't you know read it with capital letters. Um, mm. Just mm. that it is a, 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 a mode of expression. Um, but yeah, so we have this hymn Pererin Oiv, and we have this project. Um, but I'm I'm conscious that there we've talked a lot obviously tonight about the Welsh experience. There's also the Irish experience, the experience of, of people in Wexford or people who left Wexford in, in days gone by. Um, I know that Wexford has quite a strong connection, I think, with, with Savannah, Georgia as, as mm. well in terms of a That's place of, um, of, of emigration. So already there's mm. a, a, a link there. Um, but yeah, what I'd like to do in this, this last part of the, the evening, um, thank you all for staying with us. Um, is just to open it up to questions about the project. Um, and yeah, Kroisrochi Govin and Gamrag. Yeah, welcome to, to ask questions uh, and I will try and answer. Um, also, yes, I'm conscious we have Ruth Jones is here as well, who um, of the Ancient Connections project, who might be uh, would be able to answer questions about the pilgrimage route. Um, and uh, Rachel and John uh, would, can answer questions about Wexford um, as well. Um, does anybody have any burning question they want to ask? So Just while people are thinking of their questions, I'd like to thank Wynne particularly for opening my eyes about Llwyngwar Manor, 
which is just down the road from me, and oh, I yes. only have hitherto known as a rather grotty holiday camp. Yes, yeah, uh, so uh, in that's all it means to me. So yeah. I'm pleased to hear a little of its history. Thank you. Extremely important in terms of uh, Methodism in in Pembrokeshire. You know, they were, they would hold these Methodist society, um, association meetings, and you know, tens of people would, would be fed in. Uh, in Twinguadmana by the Bowen family, you know, very supportive of the Methodists. And I believe I'm right in saying that uh, George Bowen was trans was converted by hearing one of William Swantekalin's hymns sung on on the roadside, in when he was on his journey oh. through Carmarthenshire, Com I think somewhere that he heard one of the hymns. And it, well, as as Williams himself says, you know, being caught by a summons from heaven, it obviously the hearing of one of this, uh, these hymns by Williams was. Um, very effective in, in terms of one of the family of, of the thing wire anyway. Um, Someone's got their hand up, I think. Yeah, I think Owen has a, his hand raised. Yes, thanks, Rowan. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I just quick question maybe for Rachel and John uh, from Kilmacree. Um, the Irish in Wexford uh, kind of tradition would probably be different. We wouldn't from my knowledge, I wouldn't have that much of a, a hymn singing kind of tradition. We'd have our choirs at church and that, uh, but very much a much stronger kind of tradition in singing uh, what we would, I would class as rebel songs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that's your feeling, Rachel. Um, maybe you might uh, just give everybody a little context, a little flavour of what to expect from the Wexford and the Irish side of things here. Yeah, Owen, um, I suppose we're the the traditional singing we have um wexford older traditional singers here with us paddy berry and seamus brogan that would be able to help out on that i suppose traditional song is very strong in wexford mm -hmm. um it would but also paddy would you be able to speak about the kilmore carols i mean it struck me while i was listening um to professor win james there um about the hymns it struck me um, about the Kilmore carols at Christmas time and, and that whole unison singing. Um, mm. Paddy, would you be able to contribute to, to that? Can I ask you to unmute yourself? Can you? There you yeah. are. Yeah, hi, Paddy. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, that was marvellous. Very much in-depth yes. and over my head, I must say, <laughs> for most of it. And there is very little here in Wexford that would compare with that, other than the Kilmore Carols, who were which were composed in 1670s, 1670s, around that area. And the interesting thing is that uh, these the heirs that were put to the carols, uh, people have been asking, where did they come from? And I suppose it's different in Wales in that. By the way, were those uh, verses sung in Wales? Do we know what that? What the carol verses you mean? Pardon? Or, or, or the hymns. The carol carols, yeah. No, but what, what you have been talking about. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well. Yes, I mean, so in, in one sense, uh, as you rightly said, you know, we're in a different, well, we're in a sort of evangelical Protestant um, situation but uh, they do become very much folk songs yes you know if, if, even today I, I think uh, you know um, someone like heaven would agree that if you if you go into into a tavern in wales very many of the things they would be singing in there as as popular song would be hymns uh, different types yeah. of hymns colour and etc and so forth so that you know the the, the, the hymn becomes a welsh folk song to, to, a song, yeah, yeah. To, to a degree. On, on the question of, of, of carols, I didn't touch on that uh, actually, but there is an, a very interesting Welsh carol tradition, pre-Methodist, which it, it would be worth looking at um, side by side with what you're talking about now. Um, they, they were people, they, they were used it because of the dearth of preaching in, in uh, the Anglican churches. People were composing carols as sort of long sermons in song, and uh, they would come together in, I think, in Pembroke, certainly in in, in but certainly in the, in the St David's diocese, 
to to sing these antiphonally. They they would um, you know people would come together in in the, in the early 1700s, for example, and uh, would would be singing. Uh, one group singing one verse, and the other group then answering in the next verse, because of the lack of preachers. So you, that that would probably dovetail in with what you're talking about. Yeah, comparative, and you get a similar comparisons in 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 uh, the Isle of Man as well. There's another story that I heard many years ago that uh, the Salvation Army. Uh, how would they compare, or what would your attitude be? to their singing and especially their airs because I heard some time ago that the uh, Salvation Army in your country uh, weren't happy with songs that were written to body airs hmm. or body airs that were written to body songs I should say and took a lot of the uh, body songs and put them to Carl's. Mm. What, was, what, what was that all about? Was there a scarcity of heirs in your country that they had to be stolen from the body people of Pembrokeshire? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a tension that runs through um, through the centuries, really. You get it between, I, I was referring at the very beginning of my talk to, uh, to Calvin. Only very severe tunes, really, so the words of the Bible should be, should be used in, in, in public worship. Martin Luther in the same period um, is going down to the marketplace and listening to folk songs and doing exactly what Pantacalin is doing, uh, writing uh, religious um, lyrics to uh, secular love songs. And this yeah. argument, you know, why should the devil have all the good tunes? That's, yeah, that was the expression, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some, some uh, you know, that was used by uh, Luther, apparently, used by uh, Booth of the Salvation Army as well. It was something that, so it's, it's a tension that goes through uh, Christian singing throughout the, the centuries, really. You know, what is the relationship between secular and sacred uh, in terms of, of um, music? And the power of music as well, that's something that people are afraid of, that the the music emotionally could could um, drive people on, um, you know, with with um, in their with their hearts, but not with their heads, if you like, or with their emotions rather than their 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 um, their understanding. And those are two tensions that are running through, you know, there are sort of culture wars in Christian circles between those two uh, standpoints, and and that's okay. certainly as you say of the Salvation Army uh, period. Would you say that um, all the devil's songs have now been captured? <laughs> <laughs> have we still a bit to go? Yes, maybe. <laughs> but thanks very much for your for your talk there. It was just great. Thank you. I just um, in sort of slightly related to that in a way is is sort of thinking about um, or. The, the the way that Pereira Noiv has become attached to the to the song Amazing Grace. Win. I wonder if you yeah, might yeah. say a bit about that. Yes. Well, what I mean that's an interesting again an interesting example, isn't it, of of, of marrying a um, a popular nineteenth um, century um, tune yeah. to an eighteenth century words by John Newton, who of course himself was a slave trader. Um, um, later becomes converted, eventually turns his back on slavery and becomes very anti-slavery. Um, but what happens then in the 1960s, it becomes, as some of you will remember, well, it becomes a very popular um, English-American uh, song getting into the charts in, uh, in, 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 in Britain. Um, as he may, uh, Well, the words by my Newton to the, the Amazing Grace tune um, and Which, um, connected with the civil rights movement as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that was the reason for it becoming. And, you know, the, the, there's a famous clip, isn't there, of, of uh, Barack Obama singing, singing it impromptu in the, in the service, isn't, isn't there, that you'll, you'll find on YouTube, I'm sure. Um, but um, what happens in a Welsh context then, because this tune had become popular, I, I believe I'm right in saying that... Um, well, one of the Welsh um, 
broadcasters, a man called Howard Winbrin was asked, would he write Welsh words to go for Amazing Grace for um, a, 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 pro, a, a television programme in about 1970 uh, called Disca Down. Disc, the same word as the English word disc, and then down uh, is... Um, uh, means um, gift, if you like, you know, so that um, they, 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 it was this sort of emerging pop song um, period in Wales. Again, Heaven here has written extensively on this, much more than I uh, know on, on this. But uh, basically what happened was that Ruth Price, the producer of this, of this um, programme, uh, eventually suggest. I, I, I think um, Howard Green was coming to a dead end in, in writing the words and uh, the suggestion was, well, why don't we just take Panticalians for Erin Oiv? Uh, and uh, it became very popular. It went into the Welsh charts in that period and um, is still the song that, you know, the word, the, the tune that is usually sung to a Erin Oiv by now, of course. It, it wouldn't yeah. have, Panticalian wouldn't have been aware of, of that tune. It was yeah. it, his his day, but there is, there is an interesting connection there because uh, John Newton and Pantacallian could well have known each other. They certainly were known about each other. Um, one of um, the the leader of the next generation of Welsh Methodists, a man called Thomas Charles, was most famous perhaps because of his role in uh, setting up the Bible Society. Um, and there are interesting Irish connections there because he's. He's encouraging people in Ireland to use the Irish language in, in religious instruction, you know, in setting up uh, um, uh, schools to teach them to read the Bible, etc., and, and telling them to do that in Irish. But um, he, uh, as a student in Oxford, he goes for a, a summer to, um, um, to John Newton, who was a, 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 an Anglican priest at the time, uh, for uh, theological instruction. So, and as I say, so Thomas Charles would certainly have known Pantacellian and Newton very well. Uh, so there's, there are quite interesting connections there, again, uh, linked partly to the slave trade. Okay, thank you for, um, I'm just thinking it's uh, the time is running on. I think it's about mm -hmm. five to eight now, so we better sort of draw draw things to a close. I think, but um, that's um, thank you very much, um, Dioch Power Van Thord. Um, I was going to um, put up my email address, but perhaps I'll put it in the chat, and if anybody wants to get in touch, um, that. Uh, that would be uh, fine. <laughs> if you've got any questions, further questions about tonight, um, or you want to know a bit more about how you could get in involved. Um, so th we'll continue in a fortnight's time um, with David's session. Um, I know, well, everybody that, that has come tonight has managed to get in. I know there's been some um, uh, confusion about uh, the booking through the website. Um, nobody needs a promo code. Ignore that bit when you book online. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it should be very straightforward. Um, so, but if you have any problems booking, please just email me. I'm trying to put my um, my email in the chat. I was actually on it after, yeah. Um, and what, sorry, what um, I just want to say, um there that that's my email and um, perhaps rachel would you put yours in as well in case anybody wanted to contact you um um what i should have said when i was looking at the map the map is um you can use the map in uh three languages um it, it is you can use it in welsh and you can also use it in irish thanks to brian o'cleary who has um tra translated the map for us so uh, thank you um I just very enjoyed this discussion now, and um, uh, I, I know it was sort of very focused on 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 the Welsh aspect, but really interesting to hear the things that have been brought out about where differences may be and similarities, and and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more uh, more about the songs and the different traditions and the different connections um, as we as we go along. 
Ruth, can I, do, would you like to say anything just before we close uh, in terms of the Ancient Connections project? Um, well, I, I don't, I don't want to kind of go off on a, <laughs> on a long one now, we're coming to the end, but, um, but that was really um, brilliant. Thank you. Really, really enjoyable. Um, and great to see so many people from both sides of the water. And I just, just to say, I think this project is really exciting for us. I think it's really um, a really great way to sort of bring people from the two regions together, as well as connecting with people, um, hopefully from further afield. And I'm just really excited to see how it progresses from here. Thank you, Ruth. That's brilliant. Um, and we're, yeah, we're very excited to be to have this opportunity to, 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 to do this work as well. And I hope to see um, your faces again in two weeks time. Um, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, and I will say, Nostra. Ron, if I could just add, um, sorry, sorry, it's Owen from yeah, okay. uh, yeah, Ancient Connections on the Wexford side. If I could just add that, yeah, just to encourage everybody to spread the word amongst your friends and groups and families, uh, you know, get the, the word out there as to what the project is about, what we're trying to, to trying to achieve with it, and uh, start to build those networks, I suppose, with within your own communities, within, within your own singing groups and, and uh, your friends, as, as I said, but also beyond that, uh, because we're, I suppose, uh, hoping that this will, you know, uh, organically kind of grow into the diaspora and connecting with uh, communities abroad and bringing people home uh, through this kind of project and through uh, song and singing and music and everything else. So uh, just uh, you, you guys are, are the fertile ground that I hope we're, we're seeding tonight. And uh, congratulations to Roan and, and everybody in Span Arts and, and uh, to everybody involved tonight. Uh, wonderful work. Thank you so much. It's really, really uh, en encouraging. And, and one, if, if this comes off, it, it could be huge. So uh, congratulations to everyone. Well done. And it would be great if you could record your songs and put them on the map. <laughs> yes, and get your friends to record songs too. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Dilchaval Owen, thank you very much. Um, no star pal, but hopefully see you in two weeks' time. Oi uh, good, good night. Thank you, everyone. You are. Slán. Slán. Slán.